Good afternoon and kia ora to everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and spend a little bit of time this afternoon talking about some of my areas of interest and things that I'm passionate about and enjoy doing. I, I need to spend a, a minute or so at the beginning talking to you about what I'm not going to be talking to you about. And that's, I'm coming from a perspective of my work over the last several years working around the psychological and particularly emotional health of health professionals. But that's only part of the picture. And it may be that other speakers in the rest of the program, Tony and I think tomorrow morning, um, they, may, they may fill in other parts of that picture. Things like personality of health professionals, things like personality of health managers, things like um, personality of DHBs and politicians, all of that work. Uh, things like the environment and the impact of that on happiness and pleasure and, and ability to work fully to your extent within the workplace. So I'm not going to be touching on those aspects. I came to this work, um, I guess, about 15 years ago when I was, I was doing some work for, a, for when I was doing my counselling uh, degree. And what I didn't realise at the time was my, my work in this area actually started, or my journey in this area actually started many, many years before that. And the building, or about four buildings along the street here at number five Cable Street, and some of you may recall, it's now a very, I think, a very fancy coffee shop on the ground floor. The upper floors, I think there's some lawyers or accountants in the offices there. But the ground floor of Number 5 Cable Street back in those days used to be the headquarters of the Wellington Free Ambulance. And I spent, in my early life, when I was actually training in medical laboratory science to be a biochemist, I spent a lot of hours there, about, averaged about 20 hours a week working as a, we didn't call ourselves paramedics in those days, but essentially working as a paramedic. So that was a wonderful experience for me. I thoroughly enjoyed that, had a wonderful time, very rewarding, very enriching experience for 14 years that I did that. But it was about 20 or 25 years after that, um, certain memories of probably four or five events that I'd been involved in came back and revisited me. And I found that quite a scary experience at the time. I didn't understand that, what was going on. I was doing my counselling degree at the time, so I was quite fortunate that I was able to process some of that work and get a deeper understanding of what the, the emotional impacts of working in health can be. So that's sort of what has brought me to this area here. Let's see if I can make this go. I, I warn me, I've got to stand, put it up in the air. There we go. There we go. I've called this um, Building Resilience, but first do no self-harm. And I've stolen the title, First Do No Self-Harm, from a book that I was very fortunate to be able to co-edit that came out at the end of last year. And this is really the only commercial, commercial break that I'll put in. But it, if anyone wants to read more about this, it was a book that I co-edited with two colleagues, one in America and one in um, Scotland. And it's got, I think, about 45 contributors to the book that talk about the role of being a physician. We have sections on the creation of the physician, the stressors in being a physician, the joy and the rewards of being a physician, and to look at programs. And lastly in the book, I think there's 12 chapters that are written by a physician, each from a different specialty. And the fact that I was involved as a co-editor of the book means there's a lot of New Zealand voices in that book. So it's, if you want to read more in this area, that's, that's the only commercial plug I, I think I'll put in. Just to... Um, to talk about what I believe my rules of engagement in the workplace are. Flexible as I am, they're not negotiable to me. And there are two of them. I don't believe it's possible to work in health without at times being emotionally affected by some of the work you're doing. If you weren't, I'd be quite worried that that was not the case. The second one, that's my second rule of engagement that's not negotiable. Because I believe, um, I don't know how many of you flew down here, and you see the little airline, you know, if the oxygen marks falls down, what do they say? Put it on yourself first. Because you're no use to the person next to you if you haven't got it on yourself first. So I think if health professionals, if staff come first, the patients or clients, however we call them, are going to get the best possible deal they could ever get. So that, they're my non-negotiable rules. Okay, sometimes when we're talking in this area, talking about some things, you may 
Some memories of particularly um, distressing incidences may come back into mind. And I think when that happens, that's an absolute gift because it means there's something still going on there and for some reason you're remembering those events and encourage you to try and make meaning of that memory and to try and seek out support or try and understand why those memories, those incidents are still floating around. So what I'm going thought I would do today would be to, to look at four areas. One, to, and to put it in contact, this is where I'm coming from, from the area of vicarious trauma, but as I said, it's only one part of the equation. So I'm just going to briefly take you through that, some of the definitional work around that. Secondly, I'm going to do a session not on hallucinations, but hearing certain other voices, hearing the voices of physicians, and I want you to hear, or particularly read, some of the words of other physicians. Thirdly, um, in linking that work to resilience, I'm going to talk very, very briefly about five resilience projects, that four of which I've been involved with, when we're trying to get a picture of what resilience is. And we think if we can understand what resilience is, because everyone's, or many people will say, well, I feel resilient, or that person's resilient, or that team is resilient. What does it really mean? If we can understand, I, I believe, if we can understand what that means, it may help us in designing processes for supporting staff and enhancing their resilience. Now, I just wanted to declare at this time, I don't think, I absolutely do not believe it's a strategy working in health that we, we make everyone as resilient as possible so they can deal with all the rubbish we have to put up with. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, because there's, that's the other part of the equation, to make sure the work environment is good, to make sure the governance is good, to make sure the relationships are good between us and um, those who are supposedly managing us. So I'm not talking about that. And lastly, to take you on a little trip through some of the resilience building strategies that we're using now in workshops, and people have said to us, and we have some understanding from some research, that this is working and enabling people to feel stronger, better supported, and more resilient. So firstly, the vicarious trauma. And I should have mentioned at the beginning, I think we'll have plenty of time if anyone does have any questions, comments, criticisms, disagreements, please, I'd like to hear them. So in the vicarious trauma field, the other terms that are used for that are sometimes secondary traumatic stress and compassion fatigue. And there's a bit of a, a language, a bit of a semantics thing going on in the literature at the moment that saying these are the same, these are different, there's slight difference. To me, it doesn't really matter. I think that is just semantics. Um, the issue that I'm talking about really is this definition that the person who first wrote about this, and I'll introduce you to four or five people here, Charles Figley, he talked about it in this way, that it's knowing about the suffering of others, it's witnessing or hearing about the suffering of other people. Whether that's called compassion fatigue or secondary traumatic stress, vicarious trauma, I, I prefer that term. That's what it's about. The other term that's used a lot in this area, and I think there are some differences. Oh, sorry, before we go there, these, these two folk also did some work about the same time as Figley, about 20 years ago, and published a very good book that's still got a lot of useful parts to it called Transforming the Pain, where they look at vicarious trauma and they call it an occupational hazard. I think it is a hazard, but it's how we manage that hazard. There's ways of managing that. Um, Laurie-Ann Perlman and Karen Sukvitney, they both spent a lot of time working in this area. Um, the other person that some of you may come across in the past, Christina Majlark, developed the Majlark Burnout Inventory, 1981 it was first published. Emotional exhaustion is the key sub um, part of that inventory, sub part of that questionnaire that's used. And that's, that's the key to what she's talking about in the burnout area. And lastly, a person who did a lot of work with Charles Figley in compassion fatigue, and she started getting worried about the whole notion and the construct of compassion fatigue that was focusing on the negative. And she said, what about the good stuff? And in, I think in the late 90s, or mid, mid to late 90s, she was seconded to the <coughs> mental health services in South Africa to work with the mental health workers who were supporting people who were witnesses at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings. And she was seeing the mental health workers who she described as being burnt out in compassion fatigue. And her words to me were, they were burnt out through the eyeballs. But then she started asking them questions about their work and they absolutely loved doing their work. They got enormous joy, got up out of bed every morning to go and do that work and they just loved it. 
So she, what's going on here? So she developed a construct and a way of looking that, at that she called compassion satisfaction. So th that's the background and the, really the direction that I've been coming from in looking at this. Now the hearing voices bit. What I would like to do is to take you through a little pathway of hearing some voices from three different groups of physicians. The first one of physicians in training. And this work came about as a study that myself and a colleague at Auckland University did with starting about four, yeah, I guess about four or so years ago, where we set up reflective practice groups for training interns. And they were modelled pretty much on the Balint group that was developed by um, Balint and his, uh, Michael Balint, his wife Enid. But we did it, we called them Balint ish. I don't know if any of you have been part of Balint groups. There's quite a strict way of running those. We felt that we didn't want to lose any teaching or experience opportunities, so we, we played around within the Balint group quite a bit and had people doing role plays and reversing roles and trying all sorts of things. This is the, these are the words that came out of some of the participants in that group. There was 112 of them in the first year we did the program. And this is what they were saying, not only about the group, but what they, the questions and the curiosity they had about what it was going to be like to be a physician. And very often the conversations were, I don't know what it's going to be like in the future. So I guess that was a real clue for those of you who are in senior roles and working with junior staff, tell them what it's like. They're hungry to find out. Tell them about how tough it's been for you at times. Tell them how, how it's been wonderful for you at times. They really want to hear that information. These are some of the words. The last point was very common in the conversations that very often people were feeling quite alone in what they were experiencing, but when others talked about it, they realised that they were common experiences, and, and that did a lot to have them feel supported. So that's the training interns. These are the voices of registrars, and these were registrars um, and those in early into training programs, and they were about um, four or five or six years out of medical school. That was the average of the age group. These are some of the words. The last point has been a common point as well. This one I found interesting. Um, full marks to the person who would take this registrar aside and sit down and ask, are you all right? The knee-jerk response, I'm fine, I'll be okay there was a missing question there that could be followed up with a missing reflection and it might be something like feeling okay I'd be crap if that happened to me so it's actually giving permission for people to continue the conversation so that it doesn't block them off so there's that unwritten unspoken barrier there so giving people permission to talk about what they've been experiencing from registrars to consultants. These are some of the voices of consultants talking about their experiences in being a physician. <laughs> 
go back to that point. All of the words, all of the voices here, bar one of them, have been from New Zealand physicians. So it's very much within New Zealand context. So they're the voices, and I think you can see there's different perspectives going on there. The, the senior, the older physicians have had some amazing life experiences in doing their work. The younger physicians, the trainee interns are particularly saying, please tell us about that. Please talk to us about what it's like, what it's going to be like for us in that role. The middle group, the registrars are saying, look, sit down with us and help us and support us. It's really tough going for us. And some of them said, you know, have those guys forgotten what it was like? So I think that's one of the messages that's coming through. No, you haven't forgotten. But in a busy life, it's often difficult, I appreciate, to find time to sit down and have those conversations. But I think they need to be had. So the third part is to look at some of the resilience work we've been doing over the last few years and trying to get a picture of what resilience looks like. Now, they're the words from one of Leonard Cohen's pieces of poetry. There's a crack in everything, but that's where the light comes in. Okay, there's five studies I want to look at. This first one's around resilience in a resident registrar doctor group and its relationship to VT and to burnout. Um, we then went on and did a study, a literature-based study, to look at what the various health professions, and we, we selected the health professions that the University of Auckland teach for, or provide training programs for, to see what those professions are saying about resilience. And some of them were actually silent. The, there was, the literature was silent. There was nothing being discussed. Um, we looked at a study that we're just writing up, hopefully to publish at the moment, looking at what resilience means to hospice workers both doctors, nurses, and uh, other allied health staff, counsellors, psychologists, um, social workers. Um, looking at personal resilience as a strategy. And lastly, I want to move out of the individual resilience area into organisational resilience and talk to you about some really big work that's going on in New Zealand that I'm just, just starting to become involved with around what does a resilient organisation look like? That, this, sorry, this is the other part of the commercial break. If you want to read a bit more about it, there's a lot of stuff that physicians have written about in this book here. Okay, the registrar study, we looked at um, things like compassion fatigue, using a particular measure of it, satisfaction, burnout, and also looked at what resilience, empathy, and spirituality, and emotionality, or emotional competence, had to do with compassion fatigue or burnout or compassion satisfaction. Hospital registrars, about 250 of them. Um, anonymous, very anonymous questionnaire. We kept it totally arm's length. I processed all the data from this, but the data came back to a research assistant who entered the data. And I, I never actually ever met the research assistant, so we wanted to keep that as arm's length as possible. So these are some of the relationships that we found. And I'll just mainly focus on resilience. Um, Completely intuitive, I think. The pleasure and joy that people got out of job in relation to those four components, um, positive and significant, with resilience being the highest factor. We used a measure of resilience. Um, what that means is people who had high levels of resilience, empathy, spirituality, and emotional competence all had high levels of compassion satisfaction, without exception. In the burnout area, Again, I think it's intuitive. The, we saw the reverse results. People with low levels of resilience had higher levels of burnout. Low levels of spirituality or emotionality, high levels of burnout. Again, resilience had the highest relationships. In the compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma area, uh, um, again, I think it was predictable. Low levels of resilience, high levels of compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma. Um, spirituality and emotionality. No, at least statistical relationship between, um, uh, between empathy. And we used a scale that had been developed for physician empathy, the, um, the Jefferson Scale of Physician Empathy, developed at Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. And there was no relationship that we found there at all. Reason I added that into the study was that people early on had talked about empathy being a conduit to developing vicarious trauma. And to me, that didn't make sense, because what they were actually saying was that high levels of empathy mean you might have high levels of vicarious trauma. And I couldn't get my head around what high levels of empathy would look like. Um, what I, th I, th I don't think you can say they're too empathic. 
I don't think that makes sense at all. What I think was happening was what someone else, and only one other person's written about this at the time, was that this person, John Wilson, talked about um, empathic strain, where the nature of the empathic relationship becomes distorted. And I think that's what these folk were talking about, um, where there's an empathic strain. People become too close to people, talked about as pathological bonding, over-identification with the patient, those sorts of things. And I think that's what was probably going on there. Um, well, in spiritual beliefs, interestingly, we spiritual beliefs, not necessarily religiosity, but in the second one, the relationship with the higher power was a measure of religiosity. Those that um, had that scored positively and significantly related to compassion fatigue, I couldn't understand that relationship because people were saying that if they had a high level of spiritual of faith, of a belief system, they had high levels of compassion fatigue. I talked to a colleague who is a psychotherapist, he's also an academic theologian, and sees a number of health professionals in therapy. And he said what he sees with some health professionals who are really burnt out was that they talk and profess to have a highly developed religious faith. They talk about, at times, um, how can my good God do these horrible things to my patients? Um, and he said they have a hierarchy of duty. And he showed it to me like this, they have a duty to God, duty to their patients, duty to themselves. So, and some of them have said to him, I don't need to look after myself, my God will do that for me. So that's getting, he described that as a theologian, described that as quite a disrupted form of faith. So I think that's probably what we were tapping into there. Strongness connection with compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma. A scale that looked at resilience, personal strengths, and an emotional competence scale. Let's have a look at the parts of that. In the personal strength scale, these were the questions. So that people who scored highly in these items had low levels of vicarious trauma. This was one of the resilience scales that we used. In the emotional competence area, these questions, these items were really about how emotionally competent and confident am I with dealing with both my own and my patient's emotions? Interestingly, the last question there, which is really a question about, I feel okay about putting my hand up and asking for help, was the one that was the most strongly and negatively related to vicarious trauma. Of all the 140 or so questions in the survey, that was the one that was the most strongly and negatively related to vicarious trauma. So high levels of that had the lowest levels of compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma. The second study was some work we did across these various professions. We looked at both demography and behavioural, cognitive and relational aspects of it. And it said some of the literature was silent in these, I've left them off the list actually, speech language therapists. Um, there was nothing in the literature about it. We've since done a study, we're looking at speech therapists in this area. But what we did was to look at those health professional groups, um, English language, peer-reviewed journals, and the article had to focus on coping, self-care, functioning, hardiness or resilience. Um, and we didn't look at students and we didn't look at patients. So we confined the search to quite a tight criteria. The only two items that every health professional group talked about as being related to re resilience were these. Being gender, uh, a gender relationship, and more strongly being female, and maintaining a work-life balance both in the doctors, nurses, speech therapists, audiologists, social workers particularly, and, so, and counsellors. They were the strongest ones there. Four out of all, or at least, yeah, I think four out of all the other five groups that reported on this um, also talked about one or other of those four items down below, the laughter or humour, self-reflection insight. Self-reflection comes up in the next study too, and spiritual beliefs and personal identity as being factors related to resilience. The gender issue um, was interesting. These are some of the words that the people said in the literature. 
interestingly, the uh, health social, mental health social workers had a different view on the gender issue. Now, the study that we did to try and get some definitions around that, find out what resilience was all about, was some work we did at one of the hospices in Auckland. And we did this by asking the, every staff member, every clinical staff member, nurses, doctors, and social workers, counsellors, spiritual care coordinators, that type of group, um, we gave them that definition of resilience and said to them, complete the sentence. I believe the resilient characteristic is, and they completed the sentence. A whole lot of factors came through from that. Um, I think more than 35, 35 or 36 different ways of completing that sentence. Many of them were saying the same thing. And when we and independently grouped some of those um, items back, these are the results we got. And these were the results for the top seven. The people were saying, these are what we believe are the factors that help us make us resilient in doing the work that we do. Other than have, perhaps having a passion for that work, none of them talk about the clinical aspects of the work. They talk about the work environment and the relationships and sense of self and understanding and the spiritual sense and the meaning of the work that they do. Um, and that's been our experience in, in working with groups and when we do workshops, training workshops, we find the same. It's not the clinical stuff. That can be tough at times, but if all of this other stuff is dealt with, is support, there's a good supportive environment within the workplace, then things work. The fourth study, the personal resilience, and I, I love like some of those bucket list photos at, at lunchtimes. I don't know who's the most resilient of this character here. So I love going onto Google Images at times. You can always find something that you look. I just put in resilience and that came up. <laughs> I don't know who's the most resilient the guy at the top or bottom. But this was a study looking at personal resilience as a strategy. The five factors that came up in the study were very similar to what we found with hospice people and similar to what we found in the other two studies. Again, not talking about the clinical work. It's talking about that other stuff that's both within us, our collegial relationships, our relationships outside with our families and those significant to us outside of the work. <coughs> And more and more people are talking about the role of being the reflective practitioner as being very supportive and finding ways in which to be reflective, both individual ways or within peer groups, within balance supervision groups and one-on-one -on -one supervision or therapy and talking corridor conversations, coffee conversations, whatever, but taking the opportunity to be more reflective. As many, many groups are still talk and starting to talk about this as being a very supportive process in ways in which help, help us get through the work that we have to do. So lastly, just to look at the community and organisational resilience, and this is very recent work that's been done as a collaboration between the engineering departments at University of Auckland, University of Canterbury, and the collaboration started before the earthquake, so, but it's, as you can imagine, it's probably been driven, a lot of their work has been driven since by the earthquakes. What they decided to do was to have a look at, okay, we're, we don't know much about individuals' resilience, so we're going to have a look at what an organisation resili organisational resilience might look like. So they sampled um, this, some of the results that I've read. They've sampled over a thousand industries around the Auckland region. A number of them were health and social service agencies to try and get an idea of what made the resilient organisation. And it was interesting in the health sector organisations, those that reported themselves they felt they were most resilient was those that actually planned to deal with adversity. They had disaster plans or business continuity plans or whatever they called them, but they had thought about what happens if. Those that were even more resilient in the health and social service group were those that not only had the plans but tested the plans out. They were the ones that were the most resilient. These are some of the factors they found. I think there's 13 factors altogether that create a picture of a resilient organisation. And I suspect this, well, they, they looked at it just over a 1,000 organisations. I don't know from their data because I wasn't able to 
find it, whether they looked at any of the educational ones, but I know some of those factors certainly apply where I work in the educational organisation, that um, we have good or not so good resilience based on those factors. So I, I, this is a new area of work and I think it's as important as the, the work looking at individual resilience because no as I said earlier on, no matter how tough and resilient and enriched and supported you can, the person can be in the workplace, unless the workplace, the environment, has strength and resilience and support of nature as well, it's not going to go. It's not going to work good. Okay, so just to go to the last section, I'm going to take you on a little journey through some of the strategies that we've developed and using in some of the workshops and seminars that a group of myself and a group of six or seven others are doing around different health units at the moment. Different resilience building strategies. And people I mentioned before who wrote that book, Transforming the Pain, they have the little ABCs around this. And they talk about um, the awareness of our own needs, awareness of our physical and emotional resources, knowing that we've only got so much we can do, that we're not we don't have an enormous reservoir for this. We have to top up our reservoir. Maintaining that balance again and having that connection, connection collegially, connection outside with others, and they talk about a spiritual connection, decide, describe that as with something larger. So, a four-step series of strategies. The first one we do in the workshop is taking a stock of the stressors looking at doing something about that, developing some resiliency in this area, and commit to making changes. So I'll just walk you through those processes. First one is a, taking a stock. We've got a questionnaire we've developed that looks at those, um, six, those five domains. And we get people to fill out a questionnaire. And my email address was at the beginning of the slide. I'm very happy to email those if anyone wants to contact me people want to use those. It's not a scoring thing that you get a 5 out of 10 or anything like that, but it's just a little checklist. Here's just some of them from the physical self-care. So we get people to go through the self-care questionnaire to see where they're at at the moment. The second thing is, what are you going to do about that? That's the homework. The third part in developing some resiliency, and these are some of the strategies we think actually work for people. And one of the, I think one of the important aspects is working at this organisational process is getting buy-in as a top-down process. It's no, well, it's not no good, but it's, it's less good, I guess, if you're trying to do this work without having top-down buy-in. And one of the best examples I've seen of this is in one of the hospices in Auckland, the Mercy Hospice Auckland. And they, like every organisation, have a whole range of committees to look at issues, and they have a health and safety committee, and some of you may have sat on health and safety committees in your own organisations. They were looking at their health and safety policy one day, and the, the then CEO, who has now moved on to North Shore Hospice, and they now have the same process, understandably, she said, look, we talk about all the physical safety, we deal with correct clothing, correct lifting equipment, and correct disposal equipment, infection control, all of that stuff. We actually haven't talked about the emotional health of our staff. So what they developed was an emotional safety policy that got signed up by their board of directors, and that says that that organisation is going to look after the emotional health of staff. It's the only organisation I know, other than now North Shore Hospice, that have actually have that as a policy signed off by the governance process within that organisation. And they provide supervision for staff, they provide um, time out sabbatical leave for staff, they provide um, peer, peer supervision, peer debriefing processes, they provide external counselling if people need it. All of that's provided by the organisation. So the, top, the first thing is that top-down acknowledgement that I think working in health is different from working in other areas. There's other stuff that goes on and there's other things that need to be taken care of. And helping manage that and also the monitoring of staff workload and assignments and the duties. We were doing some work with a group from the education sector about three or four years ago and the person I was working with, she had worked in that sector and had gone through a period some years before that of heading very rapidly into a burnout state and her her supervisor, her manager, recognised that and walked over and said, tell me about your workload. And she said, I've got all these things to do. She said, show me your diary. So she looked at her diary and tore the page out. 
This person was working as a speech therapist at the time. And she said, you can't do that. She said, look, look at all these jobs you've got to do. No one's going to die if you don't see them today or tomorrow. And so her manager picked up the job and took the responsibility of phoning all the organisations, all the schools she was working in, and the family and said, we're having to rearrange those schedules. So it was having that top-down acknowledgement that it's really tough. The other example we had, actually from the same group of 30 staff, was when we went back for our second session with them, asking every one of them, um, what is it that you might want to make what is it, one change you might want to make in the workplace that will enable you to do your work job? One of the speech language therapists said, I want some cruisy work. And I said, well, what do you mean by the cruisy work? She says, I love the really difficult work. I find it intellectually, academically very stimulating, but it's tough. And I want to, that's up there all the time. I want to be down here some of the time doing some cruisy stuff and the easy stuff. When she talked about doing the difficult stuff, it was interesting. The whole room turned to her and said, but you do it so well. So in a sense, she was being punished for her excellence and performance. Her manager took on the responsibility of monitoring the workload and making sure she got the cruisy stuff. So I was getting that respite from the really difficult stuff. Um, from organisational down to a peer process, however you define that as team, department, group. Looking after, um, some people, one person described this first one to me, is looking after your mates. Not being afraid to say to someone, if they're looking stressed out, um, yeah, what's going on? Is there anything I can do about this? The second one, the belonging processes, being part of that organisation. And again, workload balance. Now, the two things that were found very useful at the individual level, strategies for disengagement and strategies for celebrating the success of what people do. The strategies for disengagement around separating your professional life from your private life, developing ways of doing that, boundary setting, um, spending time and hopefully as much time de-rolling as we spend enrolling on the way to work in the morning. Just putting a break between it, saying I am no longer in that professional role, I'm now that private person. Yes, if I'm on call or I've got an evening shift or whatever, sure, I'm still in that role, but acknowledging you're still in that role. Gaining the sense of achievement, setting achievable goals, being open to feedback, focusing on successes. One of the stories that I talked about before um, from the consultants, the surgeon, and he's written about this in, the, in that book I mentioned, so it's public information, but Pat Alley, some of you may know Pat at North Shore Hospital, and Pat recently retired from surgery, and he, he gives a wonderful story about a patient when he very early on in his surgical career, he operated on a patient, I think he calls her Miriam in the book, and Miriam died that night unexpectedly. So he came back into the hospital, went through all his OR notes, talked to the family, really beat himself up, couldn't figure out what had happened. A few weeks later, he was stopped at a shop somewhere and this guy got out of a truck. He talks about him as being a big beer, beer barrel chested um, truckie. And he walked out and was hand out. He said, hey, you're Doc Alley, aren't you? He said, yeah. He said, remember me? I'm Charlie, I think his name he gave him. He said, no, I don't remember. He said, look at this. And he opened his shirt and he had a scar from there to there. And he said, you did this 10 years ago, Doc, and it's still bloody good. The thing is, the, the, the point that Pat's making is we forget about the Charlies of the world and focus on the Miriams. So to celebrate our success in our work. I'll very brief, quickly go through this work here. This is just some work that my wife had done earlier, a few years ago, looking at the different factors that provide support and strengthen people in the workplace, both at a personal, professional, organisation and wider community. At a personal level, that self-care question I talked about, I'm going to briefly talk about the self-care contract in a moment, and a number of other things. And Jane always talks about the um, third to last point down there, when you come back from your leave, book your next holiday. First, thing, first job you do when you come back from leave, so you've got something to look forward to. Uh, at a professional level, that collegial relationship, being, belonging to other organisations, belonging to other groups, taking time to look at boundary issues, taking time to get supervision, taking time to belong to a peer group to discuss some of the aspects of your work. Um, message to the organisations here, the things that Jane found was that created some of the most valuing experiences people had in organisations. This was in hospice. Uh, study she did throughout New Zealand, 
things like having good HR policies, things like having good recruitment and particularly good orientation programs. They were the factors that made people feel really valued. The, one of the biggest ones was having good, effective and appropriate ways of dealing with conflict in the organisation. If that's not dealt with appropriately, that caused the devaluing and caused the stress in the organisations. And lastly, in the wider community, coming together as groups like today, coming together in groups and in wider groups through your associations and conferences and professional grouping. Um, someone else to meet, Francois Matho works in Canada in Kingston, Ontario, and does this sort of work all full time. She runs a company. And these are some of her um, things about, she calls it the 12 step plan to being stronger. Things like learning more about this, things like delegating, things like start attending to your self-care, attending workshops, things like altering job components if you're feeling you're getting burnt out in one particular area. Can we do some, do some things around that? So she's developed this 12-step plan here. Now this is the last point of this, was the personal debriefing model. And this is a model we developed working with some health professional staff. And it's around two things. One, giving that closure to your work, and secondly, acknowledging the good things you've done. Giving closure to the work, checking the job's done. If you, can't, if you can, deal with it tomorrow. If you can't, deal with it now. Acknowledge the work you've done for the day. Recall what went well, what didn't. Focus on the positives, not on the negatives. And acknowledge that what you did was the best you could possibly do with the time and resources, including internal resources that you have available. Handing over the responsibility of the care of your clients or patients. Um, being conscious that you're handing over but also that they are now responsible for doing that job. And we encourage people, if they're working in a three-shift-a-day, a 24-hour-a-day three system, that when they're handing over to someone who might be on call, to visualise in their mind the image of that person on call. So they're actually handing over to that person, and they are no longer responsible. Say the goodbyes to staff. We did some work with an allied health group in one of the DHBs recently, and they worked in a large open plan office and they said, look, we don't actually say goodbye to anyone at the end of the day. So they may, they've now made a point of doing that. And they've, they've fed back to us saying, we now feel that the day is over when we say goodbye to our colleagues. So it's helping them separate from their professional life into their private life. Debriefing and derolling. This is one of the, the third point down, particularly with nurses, taking off their nursing medal, taking off their ID badge, and derolling, getting out of that role. They, they found that really important to do. Create a space for working from home, keep to that space. And if the last point, if you're still thinking about the work, um, remember that you never, ever, ever need to be alone in that work. To know who you can call up and talk to if there's something you need to talk through. And don't let it build up. Deal with it when it needs to be dealt with. Right. One of the other techniques, and I'm not going to talk about this, in fact, our next speaker, Tony and Fernando, has done an enormous amount of work in this area. But what studies have found that there's deeper empathy, there's greater compassion, people are better able to provide care by working through mindfulness programs and engaging in mindfulness activities, and people have been better able to regulate their emotions. The last strategy that we're using in some workshops now is doing reflective writing, which is, a, in a sense, a way of supervision. And we've called it accessing the inner supervisor. And I'll give you some examples of what we've done. We get people in workshops, and I'll give them half a dozen points like that, and ask them to write a story incorporating each of those six points. And we'll change those depending on the context and the, the nature of who the group is. This is the story that came from one physician, having said that, having seen those six points. This was his story when he talked about it afterwards, of the tensions he felt. Firstly, having to leave his land to go into his training, but then leaving his land to come to New Zealand to work as a physician. So he was able to process, actually bring that out, he said, for the first time, in writing that out on paper like that. We get people to do some poetry writing as well. This was a poem written by a general practitioner. <clears throat> 
about a patient in a very horribly violent relationship and she felt absolutely powerless to do anything about that. This was another poem that a physician wrote in a, one of the workshops. When he, wrote, when he read that poem out, um, it, was, it was an amazing experience actually. The group that he was with were enormously supportive of him for having done that. And he was essentially in a group of strangers. So I thought, very brave thing to do. The group was very supportive and we then sort of abandoned the rest of the program, got into a wonderful discussion around professional boundaries and sexual tensions and relationship with patients. It was a, very, it was a wonderful opportunity for people to talk about that. And the last part of the writing is we get people to write about troubling experiences from a range of different perspectives. And I get people to write a story from the perspective of the doctor. So they write about themselves and they can start the story at any stage and just write, we've done this for as little as write for three minutes about a particularly troubling event. We then get them to reverse roles and write about it from the perspective of the patient. And as much as possible sit and remain in that role as the patient. And quite a bit of insight will often come through when we discuss that afterwards. I get them to write the story a third time from the perspective of the wise observer in the room. And that's why we call it accessing the inner supervisor. And we've had some absolutely amazing experiences of insight come through in that perspective. Because what it's doing, I think, is it's freeing the person up to write from another perspective so they are not bound in that role of doctor. They can look at it from another perspective. And this is, this is just another form of being self-reflective, just another tool. Some, it works for some people, doesn't work for other people. But in all of the groups we've run using this, um, people have adapted and taken to this, and I think generally had a, quite a good time doing it. So the last point is making a commitment to implementing these changes. And we've developed a little self-care plan that we get people at the end of the workshops to complete. And they're looking at things I'm going to keep doing, stop doing, start doing and look at those from individual, team, organisation and association, professional body levels. Sometimes we'll get them to um, say, OK, write about this stuff, or write about some of them, make a note, seal it up in an envelope, put them in the bottom drawer and take it out six months from now and see where things are at. Or we sometimes collect them in and post it to them three or four months later. So it's a little reminder that comes in the mail. Some people who have individual or team supervision where they're getting particularly individual supervision around their work. This would be particularly with social workers, counsellors, psychologists, and, and some doctors and some nurses. Um, they're finding this is actually forming the basis of their supervision contract. So they're able to use this and with their supervisor is monitoring their work and seeing how it's going for them. So, conclusion, I think that resilience could be our fence at the top of the cliff, might need a bit of repair on the fence. The things we can do to manage the emotional aspects, the things we must do, and finally, my last point would be go back to those hallucinations, go back to hearing the voices. Listen to the voices of the junior staff, the trainee interns, the house surgeons and the registrars because they want to hear your voice. They're constantly saying to us in these workshops, we want to hear what it's going to be like in 20 or 30 years time and you can tell them. Thank you very much.